Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a, a couple of comments and follow-up uh, on some earlier things. Um, it appears to me it feels like that the move towards uh, managed care and, and, the, and in my district in particular, reliance on community clinics actually erodes the safety net to a certain degree. Um, there are fee-for-service practitioners who would like to be able to participate in these pro programs. However, with the reimbursement rates, what they are, it's very, very difficult. You know, over almost 30 years ago when I started practicing dentistry, most of my colleagues actually accepted Denical, at least on a limited basis. Um, over time, I can relate to what Dr. Pan was talking about. I can relate that it, it became in, impossible for someone in, like myself, a fee-for-service dentist in a rural community, to accept Medi-Cal. It actually became simpler just to simply do the care pro bono. Um, I, I just think that's kind of unfair. When, when, you're, when you're looking at $0.35 cents on the dollar, and my cost to deliver care is $0.70 cents on the dollar, you're asking me to give care and reach into my pocket and fully subsidize that to, to provide that care. And that is a huge impediment. So, I, so I, while you say that fees are only one tool in the tool chest, I think they're a big tool in the tool chest. So the other thing that you, you talked about trying to incentivize getting dentists to um, be able to do this, and especially in rural communities, you need to back up a little bit and kind of look at one of the bigger, one of the big pictures as to why dentists don't go to some of these smaller communities. We currently have six dental schools in, this, in the state of California, and the clinics in those dental schools are a big part of what makes dental uh, education affordable. Uh, so when, when, when you have a 10% cut, um, that affects the clinic income. In order to make up for that, that lost income for the, for the dental clinics, and, and quite frankly, a lot of these clinics are, are providing services to Medi-Cal patients, a lot of them with really complex dental problems. Guess who, guess who gets to pay that extra 10%, you know, when, when the clinics, to subsidize clinics, guess who gets to pay that? The students. So then they graduate with high debt, $300,000, $400,000. That's not an exaggeration. We've got the numbers to support that. When you graduate, you now have a $4,000, maybe to $5,000 payment back on your student loans. How do you do that in a rural community and, and, and want to be a provider? Um, those are the kinds of challenges. So you have the next generation of dentists out there encumbered heavily in debt. We have 12 million people now eligible for Medi-Cal services, and it just feels like we're going in the wrong direction on a couple of, a couple of things here. So. I would also, and, and, and I would also really uh, hope that you go back. When we heard from the auditor this morning, he mentioned, you know, in order to be con to considered a provider, it was one, one procedure for a calendar year that, that be you became a provider under those characteristics. I, did, I used Google here this morning just to go in and type in my own name. I'm still listed as a provider, and although it does correctly say I'm not accepting patients, I haven't practiced for a year and a half. And so we have some, you're, that's, why, that's why I pushed you on the numbers. Mm -hmm. We really need to go back and look at what kind of a provider network do we really have and, and categorize it. How many people are just doing one procedure a year? And how many are really providing care? Mm -hmm. And because uh, I, just, I, just think, I just think we've got, mm -hmm. we've got a bigger, bigger issue there than, 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 your, numbers, than your numbers really show. Right. So I thank, thank you. No, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. I believe uh, Selena Rabanta had a question or a comment. Oh, and then we will go. Whoa. Who's I? <laughs> we'll go with Senator Pan. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you for, for being here today, and I know, Director Kent, you're new to the job, so it's, it's great that you accepted it. Um, I, 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 do, I do hope that, because you mentioned probably need to change things, I hope you take out the problem and say definitely. Um, you know, my concern is, is that we've heard uh, from the auditor, from the LAO, from people. The funny thing is, is that when someone actually has, digs in and looks, something not so good look shows up. I mean, this is information, basically there was a law that said the HCS was supposed to review provider the payments. I mean, that, that's in statute. And so when the auditor goes and looks, it wasn't done. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't take an auditor looking to have that happen. It should have already been happening. And when a first five commission got and, 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 and looked at the plans and there was no data from one plan, and the department didn't even know that. So that, that, that makes, you know, makes me a little uncomfortable, and I think some of my colleagues as well, that what's going on in the department? Who's watching the shop? Is this you know, just 
is 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 it only when people are looking and then when we stop looking we just and but meanwhile we know we're hearing from our patients i mean i'm a medical provider we're hearing from patients our constituents that they're having trouble getting care i mean i i don't know how many reports i've seen from foundations that talked about medical access problems one report after another like why isn't anything being done until finally someone has the resources to go and do an audit report and then it's like well now we'll change well, why did it need an auditor report to change? It was already in statute. Mm-hmm. Do, we need, have, do we just pass another law here? I, I think that that's very disturbing. Mm-hmm. That's very disturbing to me. That, um, and, and, and you know, in terms of the quality measures, and I know that I worked uh, with uh, Director Douglas, and I'm pl- that you know, we need to have dashboards. We need to have quality measures. We need to look at access measures. We need to make that more transparent. The department needs to be more forthcoming with stakeholders about what's going on there, and I know the department's made some progress there. Uh, but I mean, earlier today it was mentioned that uh, looking at access, we look at the CAPS survey. I'm very familiar with CAPS because I helped worked on it when I was a when I was a fellow in Boston. California Medi-Cal plans perform very poorly on the CAP survey. It's a standardized survey. It's used for managed care plans all across the country, so it's not specified to Medi- so it's not a cherry-picked thing. It's a standardized measure, and we get. Most of our plans are two stars, one stars. Most plans nationwide are four to five stars. It's a five-point scale. Yet nothing's being done. At least there's nothing overt. And you know, when I ask the question, how many plans have actually you know, gotten, uh, had consequences from not being able, the answer is I don't know. It should be at the top of your mind, you know. Or how, how many times do we how, that? That so, and I hope you'll come back to that information. But you know, the question is, is that especially as we're moving to managed care, um, that doesn't mean that the department absolves its responsibility for overseeing what's happening. You can't just say, well, we have a contract, and all we have to do is just watch the contract, and hopefully someone's watching the contract, and that's not our problem anymore. The department is ultimately responsible because the state's ultimately responsible, for being sure that if someone has medical, they can get access to the care they need. That's, that's when so the, 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 my patients don't go and say, oh, well, it's the plan's problem that I can't find somebody. It's the departments. It's the states. And we need to be sure that we accept that responsibility, that we don't use managed care as a way to basically pass off responsibility, that we have the contracts. When we set the contracts, we're the ones who have to monitor the contracts, that that's all in place. And that's really important. The other thing, you know, I'm a primary care doctor. I know how important primary care is. We talked a lot about primary care. But I tell you, as a primary care doctor, if I can't get people to see specialists, my hands are tied, too. So I, so I think, you know, I appreciate the emphasis on primary care, but in order for a primary care doctor to work effectively, if I don't have specialists I can get people to, um, there's only so much I can do in a clinic. Um, and then, in fact, actually, that speaks a little bit to people showing up in the emergency room because, actually, if I can't get them to a specialist through direct referral, fastest way to get a specialist to see them is throw them in the emergency room, hope the ER doc has someone on call who can see them right then instead of waiting six months or something or longer for doing that. And that's not very cost effective for the state, nor is it quality care. So I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, I, I, you know, I hope that uh, you can bring a, 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 a new spirit of transparency and accountability uh, to the department. Uh, I think there's, you know, I, the department's done a huge amount. There's a lot of things the department has done in the past several years with the various transitions and so forth. Uh, but we need to be sure that people are protected. And um, you know, the events to date are not very promising in terms of confidence building, but uh, but I hope that we can, uh, as we're moving forward, that we're, we're going to be sure, because ultimately it's not about the rates, it's about assuring people have access to care. But we do know the rates are part of the problem. When people are actually providing care for free that's cheaper, that's a problem, because there's only so much free care people can are able to provide. When the hospital talks about hundreds of millions of dollars of right enough, I mean, that that, that, that's a problem. And, and, and in the end, you know, we're actually paying for it as a state also around the other way. You know, but we, at least locally here, a lot of state workers, we pay for private insurance. That private insurance is subsidizing. Um, but we're not getting a federal match on that. So that may not be the most effective use of our state dollars either. So, um, so I know it's maybe not easy to hear all of this, but uh, I, I think it, it is important we need to do this for the people of California, and uh, I urge you to not just probably, but definitively change the way we do things in the Department of Healthcare Services. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Assemblyman Rabanta. 
Uh, Ms. Cantwell, Ms. Kent, I want to thank you again for being here and spending so much of your day with us. I want to just ask you a, a two-part question, um, and it's this. As you sit here today, what Medi-Cal provider rate increases do you support to increase access to care for Medi-Cal patients? So that's, that's, that's number one. And, and for those that you don't um, currently, I'm hoping that you will support many um, um, soon, um, what kind of data? I, I know you're very sensitive to data and evidence, and we all want evidence-based solutions. What kind of data would you need to see to consider being supportive? Well, can I ask a clarifying question yes. <laughs> to your question? When you say rate increases, are you saying rate restoration or increases above and beyond what existing rates are today? Both. So, so okay. any and all. Um, do you support across the board restoration of past cuts? Do you res support targeted increases to, for primary care doctors? Do you support targeted increases to reimbursement rates for, for dentists in the Medi-Cal program? Mm -hmm. um, any thoughts that you have? We'd just like to get a good sense of where you are today for, for any increases. Okay. And then... Um, would, would love to have a good sense of what data you would need to see to be supportive of others. Okay. Um, I would say that on a, on a global rate, incre uh, rate increase basis, um, that is something that we would have to um, work with the administration, Department of Finance on, right? Um, these are big programs with lots of people, and so even a targeted rate increase on a particular provider group or on something else has broad ramifications for the entire program's budget. And so, you know, I can't sit before you today and say, you know, a 5% rate increase in one particular area would be good, bad, or, um, you know, fantastic, only because uh, if you spread that across the base, I think that um, that number changes. It sounds small until, you know, Mary takes the fiscal estimate and says you just agreed to a, you know, $400 million increase. So I think what we are committed to doing is working with the legislature, um, obviously through the budget process and through your bill process, that to the extent that there's data that we can provide to you in terms of what rate increases you may be contemplating, trying to make sure that you have the right um, fiscal idea of what that actually would mean for the overall budget of the program. I think I'm also mindful of the fact that um, the budget today that we have is so much dramatically different than where we were several years ago, um, 2011 and back to 2008, when there was elimination of optional benefits, um, the provider rate reductions. And I think that this administration is particularly mindful of how bad it was just a few years ago. And so any rate increase um, has to be very carefully um, understood because it has ramifications for what it does for the overall um, health of the program, and I don't think anyone wants to be back where we were a few years ago in terms of having to cut um, additional either benefits or other types of scenarios. And so I know that's not exactly what you wanted to hear, but I think it's um, the program is really big and complicated, and so any commitment on a rate increase um, requires a lot more careful thought and analysis, but we're certainly committed to working with you. And I know, you know, to Dr. Pan's comments, um, you know, transparency is important, and transparency um, for me personally, as well as the department, um, it's fair for you to have these questions, and I think we are all committed to doing um, better because we all want to see that what we're spending our money on today is actually providing a value to the patients, and so for that, um, we are certainly wanting to work with you um, closely on, on these issues, so thank you. And then Mary. Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of data, you know, when we're talking about the fee-for-service program, and, you know, the, the LAO has talked about this, there are limitations to the data that we have as sort of the administrative entity. We get the claims information, right? We get what we pay for, but we, what we don't know is how that fits necessarily um, in the wider sort of scope of what's happening in the community. And so some of the things that we've done with providers who have come to us is we've worked with them to understand um, what is sort of the... What, what proportion of, of Medi-Cal providers are there compared to overall providers in that community? How do you even define what that, what's the right definition of community? Uh, you know, it's not necessarily always a county or a city. There, it, it's sort of the geographic area that we need to be looking at. That can be really informed by people who are really on the ground doing this work. Uh, what proportion of providers' own business is in the Medi-Cal program? That is one of the things we look at. Is, is it that this is 5% of their business or 90% of their business is Medi-Cal, and that really helps us understand 
the impact of Medi-Cal rates to the providers. And so th that's additional information we look at. We also ask them to share with us what are their costs. There are certain providers for which cost data is available and because they report that to, to OSHBID. There are many other providers where that isn't that isn't something we have access, ready access to. So it's very helpful when we have providers come in and they're able to really share with us, these are the costs of what it is to provide these services and this is what you're paying me. Let's talk about how, how this aligns or doesn't align. So that's some of the examples of data. Um, I think as, as Jennifer mentioned, it's also helpful to understand what when we're talking about facilities or even, you know, I think physicians in a, in a different way, what's the capacity to take on more patients? capacity to take on more Medi-Cal patients. So things, things like that are, are what's been helpful to us when we uh, have looked at these things. And sometimes we've gotten that data and made the decisions, as Jennifer said, that within our authority to um, undo the 10% reduction. And there are other times where we've gotten the data and it hasn't demonstrated to us a need to undo the 10% reduction. So we've had it across the board, but it's been very helpful and we're always happy to work with different providers to help us understand what, what's the data that they have that we don't necessarily have access to to help in, better inform what we're looking at. Thank you. Any other questions from any members? Uh, seeing none, I will now turn it over to Samir Banta as he will take on item number five. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're done, right? Thank you. Sure. <laughs> I just like, can't, well, I can't <laughs> appreciate it. So we're um, at the final part of our hearing today, public comment. And this is an opportunity for members of the audience who care to make a remark to do so. We have some sign-ups. Um, I want to ask you to keep your comments to um, 30 seconds to a minute, if you can, please. And please um, try not to duplicate what others have said. And I'll read the names as, as we proceed down the list. First is Helen Mater. Hello. I want to talk about Medi-Cal services for patients with autism. If you didn't know, a behavioral health treatment, specifically applied behavior analysis or ABA, is now becoming a Medi-Cal benefit. Recent CDC estimates show that one in 68 individuals now have autism. My name is Helen Motter. I'm the president of the Southern California Consortium for Behavior Analysis. This is a group of 38 providers who serve thousands of uh, clients with autism across California. And ABA for autism is an early intervention, and it can prevent the need for these children to have lifelong care. And with quality behavior intervention, half the children with autism can actually reach typical levels of functioning. And right now, Medi-Cal is setting our rates, and I've been attending the DHCS stakeholder meetings, and uh, they've been basically inferring that we should expect low rates, and this is extremely concerning to providers who are considering joining in to serve Medi-Cal patients with autism. And I need to point out that low rates will lead to limited access, poor care, and less positive outcome for our clients. Currently, right now, we work in the regional center system, which is under the Department of Developmental Services, and they've been working with us for over two decades. And when we're setting the, the Medi-Cal rates, we ask that DHCS at least look at setting rates that are consistent with the currently negotiated rates that we have with the regional center. Because uh, if, if we... You're over a minute. If you could okay. wrap, that'd be fantastic. Okay. So in... In summary, uh, rates that are not sustainable will lead to agencies not being able to provide this behavioral health treatment for individuals with autism. This will limit access to care and quality of care. Thank you. Thank you. Vivica Rydell? Sorry, I don't think we're going in order right now. Not sure. Uh, Vanessa Kahina, <laughs> on behalf of the California Society of Anesthesiologists, the California Ambulatory Surgery Association, the California Orthotics and Prosthetics Association, and the Hearing Healthcare Providers of California. I know that sounds like a laundry list of providers that I just named off, but I think that it's very indicative of the scope and breadth of the kind of services that Medi-Cal provides to one in three Californians who qualify for them. The state is coming out of a horrible, horrible recession where we made a lot of very painful cuts, including the 10% provision provider cut to Medi-Cal, but we do ask the governor and are so appreciative of the legislature in reconsidering this matter uh, to ensure that one in three Californians get the health care that they need. Thank you. Thank My you. My name is Vivica Rydell of the PDI Surgery Center. We are a specialty care service. We are a standalone surgery center providing dental surgery under general anesthesia uh, to kids from 32 counties. We opened in 2008 when all the hospitals uh, weren't, couldn't accept these children. They were losing 
about half a million each, all the hospitals. The children were on wait lists that were six, to one, uh, six months to one, uh, one year. We now see over 2,000 children every year, and these are children who have such severe tooth decay. I brought a photo of one of our patients. He came with a swollen face, was referred to us. We have basically 100 FQHCs and clinics who refer to us. These children are in pain. And if we hadn't take, been able to take care of just one kid, have him seen the next day, and, and basically we treat about 14 of the teeth. The average kid is a three and a half year old like him with a swollen face. That infection can go to the, the child's brain and they can die. California should not be in one of those states. We are a specialty care provider. We are for fee service. If we weren't there to take care of the kids from Santa Cruz to the Oregon border, these children are papoosed. The autistic parents, the parents of autistic children, don't have anywhere else to send these children. And we do it safely, and we do it efficiently, and indeed the department did uh, reverse the 10% cut for us, You're but it doesn't minute, mean that wrap, the private donations it. should take over the, uh, the, the shortfall between costs. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Hernandez and Chairman Bonta um, and the members. Uh, my name is Bonnie Panlisigi, and I'm the Chief Administrative Officer at Alameda Hospital. Uh, which is one of Alameda Health System's facilities located in Chairman Bonta's district. Alameda Hospital is the most recent addition to Alameda Health System. Uh, and it, as you know, includes Highland Hospital, San Leandro, Fairmont, John George, and the three freestanding wellness centers. Uh, AHS serves as the safety net to the residents of Alameda County, regardless of the patient's ability to pay or their immigration status. With 48% of our patients covered by Medi-Cal, AHS is significantly impacted by decreases in the Medi-Cal reimbursement. And as a safety net institution, our mission as serving all, our patients really depend on the Medi-Cal program. Um, I'd like to thank Chairman Bonta for helping to support San Leandro Hospital to stay open as well. As you've heard today, the reimbursement cuts have been real and deep, and the impacts are very um, hurtful on the actual system. Uh, we're concerned that without adequate reimbursement for services, our ability to continue the care uh, will e be Even limited. though you're from my district, I need to ask you to please wrap. All right. <laughs> I just want to say, um, you know, the patients that we have are waiting up to 150 days just for an appointment because these are the only providers that will see these patients. So I think that's, that's a very real statement I want to make. Thank you. Laurel Mildred, I represent, I represent the CBAS centers in California who serve people with dementia and severe chronic health conditions. Um, we were amongst the first cut to have the comp cut implemented, and um, we now face a fourth year of the AB 97 cuts. 51 centers throughout the state have closed. Um, the exemption and access monitoring that the state referenced um, we would say has severe flaws. We will submit our analysis, which we have done in writing because we don't have time to cover it. Um, but we will say that the San Francisco uh, experience was an exception and that subsequently San Diego uh, Center submitted a very comparable exception uh, request and it took seven months to get an answer and the answer was no and it was not based on the data. It was based on uh, statement that really this is the job of managed care. So uh, we think there are severe uh, flaws and problems with that process. And the bottom line is that 10,000, almost 10,000 seniors and people with disabilities have lost CBAS services in the last three years. Uh, good afternoon, Brianna Pittman with Planned Parenthood Affiliates of California. And what I'd actually like to do is share the testimony of a volunteer of ours and Medi-Cal patient who had hoped to come to the um, hearing today and then was unable to make it from Fresno. Her name is Samantha Gar um, Garnisa Perez. Um, she's, as a daughter of, of farm workers, I grew up knowing how difficult it was to access health care. So I was really happy when I qualified for Medi-Cal. To me, it meant the ability to take charge of my health and to do the things I need to do to be healthy and happy. Unfortunately, what I learned is just because you have health insurance, it doesn't mean you have health care. I live with my husband in the heart of the Central Valley, Fresno, California. When it was time to pick a primary care doctor, I couldn't believe how difficult it would be. I had to go to five different doctors before someone would accept my coverage. Three weren't taking new Medi-Cal patients, and of the two that were, there was a one-month wait just to get an appointment. But you can't wait a whole month when you're sick with the flu. You need to see a doctor now. Um, now my husband and I are expecting our first child. It's supposed to be a happy occasion, but because providers won't accept my Medi-Cal managed care, it's turning into a stressful situation that continues today. 
Although I have an OBGYN, I'm still having difficulty obtaining necessary prenatal tests. Just last week, I was told that an ultrasound appointment that I made six weeks ago was canceled because of issues with my insurance and referrals. My husband took the day off to drive me because the ultrasound was scheduled 30 miles away, and they actually got the call the day of the appointment. If you could um, please wrap, uh, so, we'd appreciate it, and we can also receive a uh, submitted written testimony if okay. you like. Um, well, we just want to thank you and Senator Hernandez for authoring the two bills, um, and we you know, really think that the state needs to increase medical rates. Thank you. Thank you. Jody Hicks, representing the California Academy of Family Physicians, and want to thank both chairs of the committee for having this hearing and also the work you're doing on Medi-Cal rates. And the family physicians are the specialty group that are all primary care providers. It's what they do. So answering the question on whether or not rates um, affect access, I think you know the ACA put in place the primary care rate bump in order to incentivize more providers to take Medi-Cal patients. All early indicators are showing that that was true and that happened. Um, they did lose that now and it ended in 2015. So for, for my members, that means virtually all of them were affected by about 50%. And compounding that with the 10% um, rate reduction is, is a huge hit for them. So we were using the analogy of, of tools in the toolbox. For them, they just lost more than half their tools. So it's, it's a big year for them of adjusting. And I would say, you know, if, if we thought it would incentivize them to take more at the federal level, it seems like working on rates in California would, would show the same thing. So thank you for, for working on this, and thank you for the hearing. Laura Parr, on behalf of the 911 Ambulance Providers Medical Alliance, we represent six large private ambulance companies and are encouraged today by the discussion and are align ourselves with other providers and also with Assemblymember Rodriguez's comments. Our members are the sole 911 responders in an entire county. Our folks also have no relief for Medi-Cal and um, low-income patients. They transport patients regardless of their coverage. We're just looking for some relief for these patients and their important time of need. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, Chris McKaylee on behalf of the California Ambulance Association. As Dr. Ed is quite familiar with, uh, we in hospital EDs are the only ones who have to treat all patients regardless of ability uh, to pay. Plus, we have a locally imposed contracted time period in which we have to do so. Uh, California pays the third lowest Medi-Cal rates to ambulance providers. There hasn't been a rate increase for this industry since 1990. One, um, and we are paid roughly one quarter of the actual cost of providing that service. I would draw your attention on page nine to your policy item number three that your staff has identified. Uh, emergency providers cannot be judged by an access to care standard, as with all other Medi Cal providers, because we are required by law to treat everybody who dials 911. So we would urge you to look at a different standard for judging. Uh, the emergency services sector. Thank you. Thank you. As difficult as it is to find a doctor or a dentist on Medi-Cal, I have been able to do it. Um, I have a doctor that's part of a federally qualified health center and a dental clinic that's also a federally qualified health center. Um, I have an ENT that sees me because he's been seeing me for 30 years and he just does it. He doesn't take any new medical patients. I would see a dermatologist at UC San Francisco because they have to take medical. Um, but one area where I cannot get find medical providers at all are orthotics and wheelchairs. Um, I cannot sit up without my back brace, which was made in 1997. It's about three times older than any brace I've ever had before. And I was only able to come here today because I tied a piece of rope around my waist to hold it together. And my wheelchair needs repair, but I can't find anyone to do it because the warranty is up and Medi-Cal just doesn't pay enough that they can accept it. So when I heard there was a hearing today on whether the rates are adequate, 
I had to come here and say, no, hell no. Thank you. Thank you.